Hey everyone, welcome back to our second session um, on worship ministry. Let's continue with where we left off. So we finished. Uh, we talk. We spoke about uh, very briefly the background um, of the tabernacle, why we why we needed it, uh, uh, and uh, this and the importance of it, the significance of it, uh, the instructions that God gives them, and the details that He goes on to give them. And we will continue to see that. And uh, we began with the gate, uh, which is a journey of introduction, being introduced to uh, Jesus uh, in all his offices is, uh, as our king, as our lord and savior, as a perfect lamb of God. And then uh, we encounter him at the prison uh, altar, an altar of sacrifice uh, as well. Okay, so another uh, furniture that is uh, in the outer courts, is the bronze laver, bronze laver, or, or a brazen laver, whatnot, right? So in Exodus 30, 17 to 21, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, you shall also make a laver of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it okay and Aaron and his sons the, the Levitical priesthood right when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord they shall wash with water lest they die so they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die and it shall be a, a statue forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Uh, right? So, a labor, uh, the labor of bronze, a washing place and cleansing. Uh, Aaron and his sons had to wash their hands and their feet uh, before they entered the holy of uh, or the holy place. We see that in Leviticus eight um, as well. Um, now. They were working, right? Uh, the priests, Aaron and his sons, they would work, they would touch the wood, uh, the sacrifice and whatnot. So uh, they had to wash their hands and their feet before they enter the holy place, right? So now, in as we pe people in the new covenant, we are... Uh, we don't have to work for our salvation, so to say, uh, right? We, because uh, Jesus Christ, our uh, ultimate sacrifice, has paid for it. So he is our righteousness. We don't attain salvation by works, by the things that we do, right? It has been given to us by grace, and we simply have to believe in what Jesus has done for us, right? However, we have to continue this walk of life, right? We... Uh, we run this race, we walk this life, and so which is why we are uh, we are called to wash ourselves. And in, in in word we see that the word of God cleanses us. Okay, so we wash ourselves with the impurities of the day, the impurities of life with the word of God. Right in John fifteen verse three and Ephesians five twenty six, and the work of the Spirit. Okay, so let's just go to John. Um, 15 verse 3 very quickly and Ephesians 5 26 um, just so we read the scriptures okay if anyone's there with um, if you can someone read Ephesians 5 26 and I'll read Ephesians uh, John 15 verse 3 okay John 15 verse 3 it says you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you Okay, can someone read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, please? Ephesians 5, 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Thanks, Mangi. Uh, do you mind reading it one more time for us, please? Okay. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water okay. by his word. 
by her. Thank you, right? So to make a holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, right? And then finally, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 5. It says, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He has saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Right, so we are cleansed by His Word and by and by the Holy Spirit. Um, right, so we are encouraged uh, to read His Word uh, every day, isn't it? Um, Taisha, yes, you see, you raised your hand. Hi, Pastor. Um, regarding Thanks. Ephesians, um, scripture that was just read by Mangi, the washing yeah. of her. Who is the her? It is referring to. Right, so the whole chapter is talking about. Sorry, you were saying something. Go ahead. I was asking, is it the the Jerusalem Israelite who is the her? Right. So, Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty-two onwards, it talks about the relationship between the husband and wife. But what is really going on there is talking about how Jesus is the head of the church, and the church being his bride. Right. Okay. So that's where say. So again, that's imagery, uh, metaphorical. So that's the language that's being used uh, by using the, the relationship between the husband and wife. Okay, thank you. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah, but yes. even even verse twenty five, the same chapter of Ephesians, yeah. gives it clearly that husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave yeah. himself up for her. And now verse twenty six is a continuation up yeah. for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word yeah yeah thank you charles yeah yeah Daisha, i hope that clears uh yeah another interesting thing also we see is that this brazen laver was made up of mirrors uh, on the inside Okay, mirrors on the inside. Uh, this is another interesting thing in James chapter 1, verse 22 and 25. We see that uh, the word of God is being, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is used uh, as a mirror, right? So let's again let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, um, just read it for us. Um, just uh, verse 22 onwards. It says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says uh, is like a man who looks in at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Right? You see that beautifully, right? Verse 25, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law, into, into God's word, that's what it is, uh, and not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does, uh, right? So, uh, two things is that one: now we don't live by works, like you know what the what the priests were involved with. They were working; their hands would get dirty. They had to clean, uh, you know, so to speak. And now we don't attain salvation, as I mentioned, by the works. Okay, it's by grace. However, because we walk this walk of life, we are called to run this race. Uh, we, uh, we are to read his word and not just re be the readers of his word, but be the doers of his, uh, of his word. Right? So this praise and labor, we're calling it the place of sanctification. Uh, right? uh, uh, Psalm 119 verse 9, uh, I think it says, How can a young man uh, live his life uh, pure? By living according to the word of God. Okay, so, uh, so that's the outer courts. But here's another thing, right? Uh, and once again, uh, it is possible for most of Christians to come through the gate to know about Jesus, 
uh, to know about the cross, um, to know about the word that cleanses us, and be satisfied with it uh, in the outer courts. Continue to live our life in the outer courts and not go deeper. Right? Uh, but then there is this clear invitation for all of us uh, when God says, Come boldly to the throne of grace. Right? Come all the way to my throne. That's the invitation we all have, isn't it? Uh, it's like, don't just you know be at the gate, come in. Uh, right? This, this is another beautiful imagery that I am getting of the gate when I think is a gate is pretty wide. Uh, it's like his arms are all always wide open so you can come through me you can come to me because I am the gate and then encounter me in you know in, in my word and my spirit encounter me uh, you know at the cross at, at the altar of sacrifice see what I've done for you uh, and what I'm empowering you to live your life like and then there is more don't just stand there don't just be in the outer courts let's go in a little bit more deeper right uh, does anybody know this uh, famous song by Petra uh, says take me past the outer courts yeah take me past the outer courts into the holy place I, if you haven't heard it you should listen to it it's a it's by it's a song by Petra okay so now we move into the the inner court the holy place Okay, this, uh, the holy place had three pieces of furniture. One is the table of showbread, a golden lampstand, uh, and the altar of incense. Let's just take a look at it. Uh, the table of showbread, from Exodus 26, 30, 35, and 37, it says, And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. You shall set the, uh, the table outside the veil, and the lampstand across the table, across from the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the front for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be gold and you shall cast five sockets of the bronze for them uh, i wanted us to show which is uh okay, here it is another image guys uh, very quickly which i thought is uh was amazing Uh, so from the bird's eye view, right? Uh, if if this is how the tabernacle was set, uh, uh, no, they were all organized in groups of three, the tribes of three. Um, so you see uh, the camp of Judah. Okay. This, they were facing to the east. Okay, um, the gate was always uh, facing the east. Okay, so you have the camp of Judah, and then you have uh, to the south, you have the camp of Reuben. Uh, in the Reuben, they had these three tribes with them. Uh, they're all set according to the population, the numbers that you see, right? Um, and uh, the camp of Ephraim, uh, and to the north, you have the camp of Dan. So this is the east, south, okay, west, north. Okay, so once we have this uh, picture, we know okay which side the table of the showbread is kept, which side the golden lampstand is kept, uh, and um, which side is the gate, and all of that. And also, let's talk about the obvious thing that uh, that you see is uh, you know the bird's eye view against the imagination based on the population and the way they were set up. Uh, if you were to take a picture, it would have looked something like the cross. Uh, but just thought I'd share that. Um, a beautiful picture okay uh, another scripture that is mentioned in your notes is Exodus 27 20 uh, sorry Exodus uh, 25 uh, 23 to 30 uh, I just want to read that for us 
Exodus 25, uh, 23 to 30 says, make a table of acacia wood two cubits long, a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high, overlaid with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim, a hand breadth wide and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings and for the table and fasten them to four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim and hold the poles used in carrying the tables. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold as well its pitchers. Verse 30, put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. Put the bread of the presence on the table. Okay, uh, guys, just, just want to pause. Uh, and I know we've mentioned, we've used this word already about details. Uh, it, it just doesn't stop to uh, amaze me of how detailed God is. He's, and in all of this, one thing stands out to me is, uh, you know, you don't tell me how you want to worship me. I will tell you how you should be worshiping me. You know, that kind of screaming at my face, uh, uh, which I think is just, it's just awesome. Um, right. So the table of sh uh, the show bread as in other words, also the table of uh, the bread of the presence or the bread of the face. It's also what it's called was always set, uh, you know, in the inner courts uh, before the face or the presence of God. You know, it says, no, let it be on this table always before me. Um, right so in the tip in the show bread represents our daily bread as we read in matthew chapter 6 verse 11 give us this day our daily bread right it is the meeting of our spiritual need through the word and this is what i'm calling it as a place of satisfaction so we had the, the gate as the introduction the altar as a reconciliation uh the brazen labor as a place of uh or is it the sanctification? And then we have we are at the place of satisfaction in the inner courts. Uh, and Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus very famously says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth uh, of God. And it is also a bread of divine provision. Uh, Philippians 4:19. Uh, God shall supply all my needs according to his riches uh, and glory. Right, and Matthew 15, verse 25 to 28, we know about uh, the woman or the Seraphician woman, uh, and they're having this conversation about the bread, uh, Jesus and her. So, and she's fighting, uh, con uh, interceding for, uh, for healing uh, and deliverance. Right, and then nevertheless, Jesus goes on to say that I am the bread of life, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Um, right. Some time ago, we we were talking about uh, the allegories, right, and the symbolism that God just loves to use. Uh, he's like he's communicating something without communicating, in a sense that uh, he he doesn't necessarily have to communicate everything verbally. Uh, he loves hiding messages in some of those things. Uh, you know, uh, for, I mean, for example, like the bread of life. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Beth means uh, the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. Uh, he has his own sense of humor, isn't it? <laughs> bread of life is going to be born in the house of bread. You know, it's just small things like that. And uh, uh, we are surprised and amazed by it. But then, you know, the young Jewish kids who are raised uh, in the synagogues, who are who are sent to this Bible school from the age of two and three, uh, they're like, oh yeah, you know, it's just, you know, don't you see it? It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's just amazing how God communicates. Right. Uh, it is. It is here we uh, see that he satisfies us. Uh, you know, uh, he's our everything. He supplies for our needs, for our wants. Uh, he is. Uh, uh, he is our daily bread. Right. Uh, and we live by every word that comes from his um, mouth. Right. Another furniture uh, is the golden lampstand. It's a place of illumination. Uh, it says in Exodus 26, 30, 35, 37, and you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern 
which you were shown on the mountain. Uh, you shall set the table outside the veil and the lamp stand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south. Okay, so now we know uh, which side the south is. Um, so that's where the golden lampstand was set up. Elisha, I see your hands being raised. I have a question. Yes, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, this um, uh, satisfying deduction we are able to make from the table of showbread, are we also able to make same um, con deduction from um, the the bread that was broken at the table? So did you hear me? Yeah, uh, could you repeat the question though, uh, Elisha? Yes, um, I was saying that this uh, satisfying deductions we are we are making from the table of showbread yes. as the bread meeting our spiritual need, yes. uh, our divine provision and the healing and then deliverance. Can we make the same deductions from uh, the bread that was broken at the um, at the Lord's Supper, yes, yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you look at Leviticus chapter twenty-two, actually, so it says that the priests were entitled to eat the old low old loaves after seven days while standing in the holy place. So they will sprinkle some frankincense on it uh, because it's bitter. So what they would do is they would like pass the bread uh, amongst the priests inside, and then they would break it and they will eat it. Uh, and that's again when you see how the passover happens uh, the lord's uh, the last supper the lord's table is they break the bread and they pass it around uh, which is again symbolic of jesus saying that uh, you know this is the body that was broken um, and so it's also a reminder of that of of communion um, that we partake of of the bread and the wine okay all right thank you very much Pastor. You're welcome. Right, so uh, the next piece of furniture as we were talking is uh, the golden lampstand. Uh, we just, it's a place of illumination. We see that uh, he is the light uh, of the world. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, uh, and it's Psalm 119, verse 105. Um, I think, uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Um, so he illuminates our path. He illuminates our lives. Uh, he brings light into the darkness that we were in. Right? So we were dead uh, in darkness, but he brought us into this eternal uh, light. Um, right? In Exodus 27, this instruction says, And you shall command the children of Israel that you bring uh, you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Twice every day, morning and evening, a priest attended to the wick and repl replenished the pure beaten olive oil for the lamps. Uh, it is it it also comes down to our responsibility uh to keep the fire in us burning uh is in in constant communion and fellowship uh with god and you see the the process is uh uh the progression is is so clear from the gate to the altar the labor to the showbread and to the golden lampstand uh, is is just get taking us deeper and deeper and deeper into a relationship uh, with God. So, um, right, on the lamp there is oil and fire producing light, representing illumination and revelation. Uh, this is the illumination and revelation which the Holy Spirit brings into our lives, both directly and through the illumination of the scriptures. Right, so every time. Uh, we read from his word, uh, we encounter him, uh, there's a new revelation that happens, right? A revelation uh, simply means uh, an unveiling, right? It comes from that root word of unveiling that's happening, um, right? So that is the uh, the golden lampstand. And, and the last piece of furniture is the golden altar of incense. 
golden altar of uh, incense, uh, which represents uh, intercession. Uh, in Exodus 30, 34, 38, it says, incense was a mixture of four rich and uh, rare spices, which cannot be identified uh, today. Uh, and so the priest would take this mixture, put it on the altar of uh, incense, and the whole inner court will be filled with this uh, smoke and the fragrance of uh, of this incense. Right? Um, it is the altar of incense our emotions are surrendered with intercession and spirit comes to life with uh, with worship uh, it is at this altar where intercession begins uh, where the inner court is the place of prayer petition requests and intercession uh, right so after all of these things of 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 all the busyness that is happening in the outer courts, uh, with everybody running around, creating the sacrifices done, washing their hands and their feet, and and suddenly it seems like okay, the the things are getting a little bit, bit more less busier in the holy place, um, right? And in the outer courts, there are I mean, there's a lot of space. You can have 50 people, uh, 100 people, whatnot. And then suddenly the room becomes a lot smaller uh, in the inner court. And then there is a veil that separates the inner courts from the holy of holies. Right. So the outer court and the inner courts very much involves our duties as a Christian. Right. What we need to do to move into the place where we really want to be which is the Holy of Holies. Now, every time we talk about the tabernacle, generally we talk about, uh, we, we don't talk about the gate, but we talk about the outer courts and the inner courts and the Holy of Holies. But when you read, when we read Exodus 25, right, when we read Exodus 25, verse 10 onwards, God doesn't start with the outer courts, but he starts with the ark. He starts from the inside and then goes out. And we come in from the outside to the inside. But we always have to keep this in mind that the most important thing uh, is his presence, is meeting him uh, you know, face to face. Uh, and then God has made a way for us. Um, and we know about, uh, as in I don't really want to talk in depth about uh, this place we this is where you would meet God face to face. And something that uh, was shared to me a while ago was uh, this. You can, uh, you know, pray in the outer courts, you praise him, right? You I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Uh, you know, there is like a group of people, uh, in like almost a crowd, right? So you can praise him, you can thank him, uh, you know, with the crowd, uh, you know, in the outer courts. And then you come into the inner courts, uh, you are tending to the table of shoe bread, uh, you're making sure that there is oil uh, in the lamp, and you're ma and making sure that there is incense always coming out from the, uh, the altar of incense. So you are praising God with a group of people, with a crowd, and you, you are serving Him uh, with a group of people. Right? You're serving, uh, let's say, uh, you know, your ministries, your church ministries, you have a team, you are serving God with, with a group of people. But you can only worship Him face to face. You can only worship Him one on one. Right? Um, and so that's the invitation uh, and the progression that we see that God is inviting us. Is He's saying, don't be satisfied at where you are in the outer courts. Yeah, praising me and worshiping, giving thanks, and all of that is great. Uh, knowing me as as your Lord and Savior is important, and it's amazing. It's 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 a must. Uh, but then don't stop there. Come in deeper. Uh, come in deeper and uh, taste and see that I am good. You know, uh, partake of me. And then again, don't just stop there. There's more. Now that the veil is torn, I have made a way. Through my blood, I've made a way. So you can come boldly to the throne um, of grace, the holy of holies, the most holy place. Right? Um, 
So this is communion with God. Communion is being with God. Uh, just, and this should be the desires of our heart. Is is that you just won't be satisfied? Yes. And whichever ministry that you are leading, uh, even if you're, if it's uh, personal uh, walk with God, and uh, if you're pastoring a church, leading a church, uh, and whatnot. Uh, Always push for more because there is more. Uh, don't be satisfied or be content at where you are uh, because the invitation is always there. It's like we are being invited to come in deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? So uh, that's kind of concluding um, with the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, does anybody have anything to share or ask questions? Any questions? Okay. All right. Um, so if there are no questions or thoughts that you want to share, uh, we can move on uh, to David's tabernacle. Um, right. So uh, just to give a very quick background of the tabernacle of David. So uh, from the tabernacle of Moses, uh, you know, uh, everything that's happened, every, everybody builds the tabernacle. Uh, just one last thing, uh, guys, uh, if it's okay, we just go to the last chapter of uh, of Exodus. Can we do that? Is that okay? Uh, just go to the last chapter of uh, Exodus is something um, that else that I wanted to share with us. Moses first encounters God in a burning bush, right? And that's where he gets his assignment. God tells him to go to the uh, to Egypt uh, and uh, bring the people of Israel out. And then the next time he comes, uh, it's not just a burning bush; um, the whole mountain is on fire, right? Um, and then something significant happens in um, Exodus chapter forty. Uh, Exodus chapter 40. Um, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, so uh, but maybe just a couple of verses. And uh, Exodus 40, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. Place the ark of the testimonies in it and shield the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up and set up its lamps. Okay, let's fa uh, move fast forward. Uh, let's go to uh, verse 16. Okay, verse 16. Uh, it simply says this, Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Okay, uh, can you read that with me wherever you are? It says, Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. What does it mean? Moses obeyed God. Okay, um, verse 17. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month. In the second year, when Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. Underline that. Verse 20. He took the testimony and placed it in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement cover over it. Verse 21, then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain and, the uh, and shielded the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded him. Verse 22, Moses placed the table in the tent of the meeting on the north side as the tabernacle outside the curtain and set out the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. You guys with me? Are you getting bored? <laughs> uh, verse 24. He placed the lampstand in the tent of the meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. Verse 26. Can we go ahead? Moses placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtains and burnt fragrant incense on it as the Lord commanded him. Then he put up the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offerings near 
the entrance of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord commanded him. He placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting and approached the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up a country uh, courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Okay, even this chapter, it starts off from the inside out, isn't it? So, Moses did everything as the Lord commanded him. Moses did everything as the Lord commanded him, as the Lord commanded him. So, after all of this, then we come to verse 34. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Right? Now, this it was the same Moses who stood uh, in the very presence of God for 40 days, 40 nights in the mountains while he got the blueprint from God. And now it is the same person, Moses, who is, is not able to enter into this presence of God because of the weight of his glory. Uh, what I want to emphasize um, here and leave is in everything God has told him to do, I think the key here is obedience. Right? So for the first time we see Moses encountering God in the burning bush, uh, he obeys, he goes to Egypt, he comes back now, see uh, the whole mountain is on fire, and then he and then God gives him a set of instruction to build a sanctuary, a meeting place. He finishes that. And now God shows himself bigger and he's not able to step in. And something about obedience that that God wants, God makes himself bigger in our lives. And every time we obey him, it uh, feels like he shows up uh, bigger in our lives. And that's simply what worship is. Uh, and worship ministry is all about is that we don't do things the way, uh, our way. Uh, we need to, in any ministry that you might be leading, is that we lean into his heart. Uh, we say, okay, Father, I want to worship you, uh, and only you can teach me how to worship you. Um, and so when we obey him, and he shows himself bigger in our lives, and that's exactly what's happening and uh, happened uh, in, in the life of Moses as we read in Exodus chapter 40, uh, that it was so thick that he could not enter um, and whatnot, right? I feel like I need to stop here because uh, I think we've spoken enough about it, a lot about the tabernacle. Um, right? You, you guys doing all right? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, but then I'll stop here and we'll resume with the latter part. Uh, of the course uh, the next week. I right, guess thanks for joining in. Thanks for listening patiently. And I hope you learned something. And just continue to meditate on this and uh, see what God continues to speak to you. And I'm sure he will. All right. So I'll see you all next week. Guys, take care. Bye. Bye, Pastor. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye.